Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Alzheimer's Today, or I'm sorry, Understanding Alzheimer's Disease in Individuals with Down Syndrome. Thank you for being here. These complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration with our partners. You can see all of them up there on the screen. We have O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choice Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, and of course, Alzheimer's Orange County. And my name is Kim Bailey with Alzheimer's Orange County, and I'm proud to be your host today. Our sponsors are providing these webinars as a service to the community on topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for and works with older adults. And of course, we hope that you find them informative and useful. I've had the privilege of working with Eric very closely over the last uh, oh, five or so years uh, here at Alzheimer's Orange County as we've partnered together on our Down Syndrome slash Alzheimer's disease program here. He is the manager of the Down Syndrome program at UC Irvine uh, at UCI Mind, and he has managed the clinic there for over 20 years. He holds a bachelor's degree in biology from UC San Diego and a master's degree in genetic counseling from UC Irvine. His research interests include aspects of both de development and aging in indiv individuals with Down syndrome with a primary focus on the connection between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. And everyone who has worked with him, uh, especially the families, uh, know him to be a great humanitarian. And of course, he is a subject matter expert on Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. So we are very honored and privileged uh, to have him with us today. Uh, I know him best through our work together with the support group that we've uh, co-facilitated over the last few years for family members who are caring for an adult child uh, with Down syndrome who uh, has symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and I'm very pleased to have him with us today. So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to him with our presentation today. So Eric. Thank you for that kind introduction Kim and uh, welcome to all of our attendees. I will be uh, describing uh, some brief comments uh, that will allow you to get some understanding of Alzheimer's disease in individuals with Down syn syndrome. And I'd like to acknowledge the National Task Group on Intellectual Disability and Dementia pra Practices. The NTG um, has developed uh, some useful resources, including an early dementia screening tool for persons with intellectual disability or developmental disabilities, including people with Down syndrome. They've developed practice guidelines for dementia assessment and care for this population. They've also developed educational and training programs for health professionals and caregivers. Many of the slides that I'll be presenting today were in fact developed by this task group. And you will find a link to the NTG's website provided in the resource page that each of you has received with your package handouts. The objectives of this presentation are to provide each of you with an introduction to Alzheimer's <laughs> disease and in individuals with Down syndrome that will include an understanding of the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome and an understanding of the biological links between the two conditions, the symptoms that are experienced by affected individuals, and how Alzheimer's disease affects family and care staff. So I'll start with a little bit about Down syndrome for some background. Down syndrome is a developmental and intellectual disability that is caused by a genetic condition. It is the most frequent form of cognitive impairment caused by this chromosomal abnormality or genetic condition. Cognitive impairment is a term that was formerly known as mental retardation but that term is now viewed as pejorative by our society, so we use cognitive impairment instead. It's thought that 10 to 12% of people with intellectual disabilities, in fact, have Down syndrome. The birth prevalence of Down syndrome is about one in 800 to one in 1,000 live births, resulting in approximately 5,000 births per year in the United States. 
It's thought that there are close to 300,000 people with Down syndrome living in the United States, with about 2,000 here in Orange County and approximately 14,000 people in the state of California. So Down syndrome is caused by a triplicate state or trisomy of all or a critical portion of chromosome 21. Now we inherit our chromosomes from our parents and most typically that would include 23 pairs of chromosomes. You've probably all heard of that website called 23andMe. That's in fact what it's referring to, the 23 pairs of chromosomes that we typically have. We get one of each of these pairs from one parent and the other pair from the other parent, uh, resulting in a total of 46 chromosomes. But people with Down syndrome have 47 chromosomes. They usually have 23 pairs plus an additional copy of chromosome 21. Hence the word trisomy, tri meaning three, somy referring to the chromosome body. This additional genetic material from chromosome 21 alters the development and course, and I'm sorry, alters the development and causes the characteristics associated with Down syndrome. Some of the common characteristics include uh, characteristic facial features, developmental delays, mild to moderate or even severe to profound intellectual disabilities, and an increased risk for certain medical conditions. And we'll be covering some of those today. For some background on dementia, so what is dementia? Dementia is a broad term that encompasses many different conditions. Sort of how the term genetic diseases is a broad term and Down syndrome is just one of the types of genetic conditions. Dementia refers to a loss of cognitive functioning that's severe enough to interfere with daily functioning. Loss of cognitive function can include problems with memory, thinking, and reasoning. It's important to know that the term dementia describes a group of symptoms. Dementia is not a specific disease. I want to point out, though, that the term dementia and Alzheimer's disease are often used interchangeably, and you will probably hear me do, do that uh, throughout uh, our talk today. Uh, a common thing for someone to say would be that the doctor has said, my son has dementia, but thank goodness he doesn't have Alzheimer's. Uh, it just illustrates uh, how commonly these two words are used to refer to the same thing when in fact they are not. Alzheimer's is in fact just one form of dementia. It happens to be the leading form of dementia, uh, both in people with Down syndrome and people without. Uh, there are some dementias uh, that are quite treatable. Uh, so an example of some of these are dehydration or vitamin B12 deficiency, but other dementias are irreversible. These would include Alzheimer's, vascular de dementias that are associated with strokes, or Lewy body de dementia. It's important to note that dementia is not a part of normal aging. However, the leading risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is in fact advancing age. That is true for people with Down syndrome and people without. So a bit about Alzheimer's disease. As I said, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. It comprises 50 to 70% of all dementia cases. And in people with Down syndrome, it's just about the only form of irreversible dementia that is seen. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by, by a gradual onset. It's a progressive disease where individuals progress through the course and lose abilities and skills. They have trouble remembering new information. It results in an impairment in their daily activities, such as how to perform their work tasks or some of their self-help skills. There are two abnormal structures called plaques and tangles that are the prime suspects in damaging the brain and leading to the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Plaques are deposits of a protein fragment 
called beta amyloid. And these build up in the spaces between the nerve cell, and you can see those in the diagram on the upper left of this slide. Uh, they're sort of those fuzzy little areas. Tangles are twisted fibers of another protein that's called tau. These build up inside the nerve cells, so you'll see that as those swollen in, in large nerve cells in the diagram there. Though most people develop some plaques and tangles as they age, those with Alzheimer's disease tend to develop far more. They also tend to develop them in a predictable pattern, beginning in areas important for memory and before spreading across the brain into other regions. Scientists do not know exactly what role plaques and tangles play in Alzheimer's disease, but most experts believe they play a critical role in blocking communication among nerve cells, and this disrupting process that cells and this disrupts the process that cells need to survive. It is the destruction and death of nerve cells that causes the memory problems, the personality changes, and the problems in carrying out activities of daily living and all of the other symptoms of Alzheimer's. It's the destruction of these nerve cells that's also responsible for what we call atrophy of the brain. Atrophy is just another word meaning shrinkage of the brain. So the brain actually shrinks as the individual progresses through Alzheimer's disease. Now the gene that produces amyloid is on chromosome 21. And this is the primary link between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. The extra copy of this gene leads to a lifelong overproduction of amyloid. And it is thought that this excess production of amyloid sets up a cascade of events that leads to the development of amyloid plaques and then the neurofibrillary or tau tangles. In fact, all persons with Down syndrome will develop sufficient plaques and tangles by age 40 years that they would meet the neuropathological criteria for Alzheimer's dis dis disease. But it's important to point out here that even though this pathology is present in all people with Down syndrome at this age, it does not mean that they will all develop the dementia. So what are some of the warning signs of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome? Unexpected memory loss is common. Uh, an example of this would uh, be uh, particularly relevant for our patients. They tend to be very good at remembering birthdays of family members and birthdays of uh, anyone that they meet. <laughs> and uh, as uh, the dementia presents, uh, families will report that they're no longer able to remember upcoming birthdays to friends and family. They will develop difficulty doing usual tasks, so it will affect their ability to carry out their self-help skills, such as bathing or dressing, and it can affect their performance at their jobs. They often get lost or misdirected. For those individuals that travel independently by bus to their workshops or their day programs, uh, they can get con confused and maybe forget to get off the bus at, 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 at their uh, stops. They develop confusion in familiar s situations. I remember a family telling me that their son would proudly serve as an usher every Sunday at, at their church, but as the dementia developed, he lost the ability to perform these skills. He would be confused as to where he was and what he was supposed to be doing. They develop a personality change, most commonly uh, symptoms of depression. They can socially isolate themselves, but we'll be discussing a, a bit more about that in upcoming slides. They develop problems with their gait or walk, walking. They can have difficulty navigating around op obstacles that are in their path, difficulty navigating stairs or curbs. The new onset of seizures is common in adults with Down syndrome, and we'll be discussing a bit more on that in upcoming slides as well. People with Down syndrome also develop characteristic changes in speech and often new onset urinary incontinence. 
So some of the early symptoms that occur in individuals with Alzheimer's disease who have Down syn syn syndrome include uh, reduced interest in being sociable. They tend to isolate themselves, wanting to spend more time in their room, less time wanting to talk with people, not interested in coming out and so 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 socializing when guests come to the house. They have a degree, decreased enthusiasm for their usual activities. So their hobbies and pastimes that once brought them pleasure, they tend to withdraw from. They experience a decline in their ability to pay attention. So it can be difficult for them to follow instructions that are given to them. They can experience sadness. Uh, unexplained crying is somewhat common where the individual is found tear, tearful and when asked why they're crying, they can't really explain why, uh, but they are experiencing the emotion of sad, sadness. They can become fearful and experience anxiety. Uh, this is most commonly encountered when they are uh, trying to walk. They can experience irritability, become very stubborn, and uh, on occasion show some verbal and physical aggression. They can become restless and have sleep disturbances where they have difficulty falling asleep at night. They're sleeping in later in the morning or they're waking at night and uh, having trouble going back to, to sleep. As we mentioned, the seizures that begin in adulthood are a common feature of Alzheimer's in people with Down syn syndrome. Changes in their coordination and walking are also quite common. Individuals will have trouble navigating stairs, so that when they approach stairs, they're, they will be very cautious and they'll hesitate, maybe want to grab onto the arm of someone that's close by or grip the handrail and slowly walk upstairs. Same thing might happen at a threshold at a door or a curb or even a change in the pattern of the floor of, of the flooring. So if someone's walking from a, a white tile to a black carpet at that transition from that white tile to black carpet, they'll stop and take an exaggerated step over that transition. Uh, often confused as to what that is. Is it something they're supposed to step up upon or something uh, step down into? Uh, they can uh, often uh, develop uh, behavior change where they're quite noisy, where they might yell for no reason uh, and become quite excited. I want to mention though that Alzheimer's disease often looks different in people with Down syndrome. First of all, it has an early age of onset. An early age of onset of Alzheimer's is defined as the onset of Alzheimer's before the age of 65. And in fact, in people with Down syndrome, the average age of onset of Alzheimer's disease is approximately age 53. So it's a much earlier age of onset than we see in the typical pop population. The abrupt onset of seizures we've already mentioned. It's thought that about 70-75% of people with Down syndrome who develop Alzheimer's will develop this new onset of seizures. The seizures typically take the form of two types. One type being known as a generalized tonic clonic seizure, what used to be known as a grand mal seizure where the individual loses consciousness falls to the ground, has convulsions, and may in fact uh, lose control of bowel or bladder. The other type of seizure is called a myoclonic seizure, myo meaning muscle, clonic meaning jerk, where the individual just has a very uh, brief but abrupt uh, jerking of their limbs. It almost looks like someone snuck up to them and said boo, and they startled. So it looks a bit like a startle. Um, I want to mention that this onset of seizures can be very early in the course of the disease or uh, in the middle or later state stages. People with Down syndrome who experience Alzheimer's also have a more rapidly pro progressive course, a course that typically 
uh, last five to six years from very first signs to end uh, stage or end of life. And this is about twice as fast as what you would see in people with Down syndrome, who people without Down syndrome rather, who develop Alz Alzheimer's. Uh, development of new onset urinary incontinence is also uh, an early symptom in people with Down syndrome. And short-term memory loss is commonly thought of as the first sign of dementia you might see in somebody who has Alzheimer's, but that's not always true for people with Down syn syndrome. It's not uncommon for some of the other symptoms that we've been talking about, like behavioral change, to be the first sign. But um, memory loss, both short-term memory loss and long-term memory loss are common uh, for people with Down syndrome as well. Impairments in motor coordination, we've already discussed the issue with walking and balance, but impaired motor coordination also affects the upper extremities. So you might see an individual tr sitting at the dinner table trying to reach for their glass to take a drink from, and their hand falls short of, of that glass as they extend their arm out, but they try and grasp the cup, but they're really just grasping the air. It appears to many as though they have a problem with their vision, a depth perception issue, but it's really uh, an issue with uh, impairment of motor coordination. And uh, we've mentioned the sleep and wake cycle disruptions that I'll cover a bit more uh, in upcoming slides as well. So the stages of Alzheimer's disease are listed here, early, middle, and late stage. Individuals progress through these changes at different rates, but the sequence of decline often follows a predictable pattern of a progressive de de decline, as I said, over a period of five to six years. So in the early stages, there can be confusion with carrying out tasks, the memory loss, disorientation in space, so they're not as oriented in their homes, finding their way from the bathroom to the bedroom to the kitchen. Uh, they can have problems with carrying out routine tasks. Um, so, the, so the sequencing of tasks becomes a problem. So people that were able to carry out two and three step tasks um, often lose those abilities and uh, they have to be simplified to just single step tasks. They develop uh, changes in their personality and their judgment. Many families will describe a general slowness that they had observed first, usually at a period of time when they're not expecting that these early changes are dementia. Uh, but when they look back, they will say the first thing they noticed is that they were just slower. Everything took longer. They still had the same skill set so all of the activities of daily living that they m mastered, getting themselves up, having breakfast, getting ready in the morning to go out to work, they could still do those things, but they would notice that they were taking longer and they would be late for the bus. And the middle stages, uh, the impairments with activities of daily living progress, often they'll need more assistance from care staff such as verbal prompting or hand over hand prompting to complete those tasks. You can see an increase in some of the psychiatric changes, including some anxiety or agitation. You can see a worsening of the sleep problems. They can have difficulty recognizing familiar people at these, at these stages. They recognize everybody that are friends and family, but they can often have difficulty remembering their names. Speech changes are common, and those usually comprise um, a sort of a slurring of speech. So the speech articulation is poor. So individuals have trouble understanding what they're trying to say, and the complexity of speech will change. So individuals that had full sentence speech will now lose some speech and uh, maybe just uh, have phrase speech at this time with few words. 
and we've touched on the difficulty walking and the balance changes. Um, towards late stages, they could have a complete loss of speech. They can experience loss of appetite, an unwillingness to want to eat, and of course, weight loss often accompanies that. Uh, they t tend to be uh, uh, entirely incontinent with both bowel and bladder. Uh, they tended to lose the ability to walk at these late stages and are confined to a wheelchair or bed. Um, they have a total dependence on others for all of their self-care needs. And um, dysphagia or uncoordinated swallow is a very common late stage con Condition. And uh, this dysphagia or uncoordinated swallow results in a condition known as aspiration pneumonia. And this becomes quite common. So the, the body loses its ab ability to coordinate swallow. So when they're drinking or eating, instead of swallowing that into their stomach, they swallow it into their lungs, and this leads to recurrent pneumonias. And in fact, pneumonia is the leading cause of death in people with Down syndrome, and uh, the vast majority of those are associated with Alzheimer's. So how do we diagnose Alzheimer's disease in individuals with Down syndrome? Most commonly, people notice the first signs of Alzheimer's occurring in the early 50s. But the range is quite broad. Individuals can have signs of early dementia as young as age 40. Generally, the signs are more noticeable among adults with Down syndrome. And the diagnosis usually occurs within three years of the onset. Uh, so when the individual first showed signs of change, the diagnosis is often made within three years of that onset. Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent form of dementia in people with Down syndrome. It's important to recognize that people with Down syndrome may not recognize the symptoms in themselves, or they may be unable to speak to anyone about what they are experiencing. Occasionally, our patients will say things like, my brain is playing tricks on me, or I can't think anymore. Even though many never describe such things, many do experience frustration or anger with the loss of their abilities. Still, others seem to be blissfully unaware of the changes that they are happening, that they are experiencing as they are happening, and they transition in to dementia without seeming to have any concerns. So how do we assess for Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is still a diagnosis of exclusion. There is no formal criteria or diagnostic test for people with Down syndrome to detect Alzheimer's. There's no blood test that we can currently do. There's no brain scan that we can do. Now we're hoping to get to a point where we'll have a diagnostic test from such uh, technologies, uh, but we aren't there yet. So the diagnosis of exclusion, we're going to touch a bit more on in upcoming slides, but it relates to the differential diagnose, diagnose Diagnosis. A particular challenge for assessing Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome relates to the lifelong cognitive impairment that they have, especially for untrained clinicians. This can be a challenge. So many people with Down syndrome are oriented to day of the week, month, year. So that may be a skill that they lose as they progress into a dementia. Other people with Down syndrome never had those skills to begin with. So if you had an assessment tool that would challenge orientation items like that, whether or not the individual with Down syndrome doesn't know the answer could be related to an individual having had that skill but lost it or someone who never had it. And it's very difficult to distinguish those two. So 
for people with Down syndrome, it's very important that we establish a baseline of their intellectual and functional uh, uh, abilities. And in fact, the current healthcare guidelines recommend that that's done at approximately age 35. So we can capture sort of a snapshot of how the individual is doing at their adult best prior to the age, that would be the age of 40, where we would be where we would start to be concerned about a potential dementia related change. So this individual or this assessment needs to be very specific to the individual and we rely heavily on a reliable in in for informant and this tends to be a family member or a caregiver who has known the individual for many years. And the differential diagnosis we'll discuss a bit more, uh, but it's important for us to go through that so we can rule out any reversible conditions um, that may be uh, responsible for the decline in their functional uh, abilities. And then it's important to reassess the individuals at established intervals um, against that baseline. So if you've had the opportunity to assess someone when they were at their adult best, uh, it makes that nice bench benchmark to compare future assessments to. So here are some of the conditions that we have to consider um, when we talk about a differential diag diagnosis. These are all diseases and conditions that occur more commonly in adults with Down syndrome. So depression is common even in the absence of Alzheimer's in people with Down syndrome. It's thought that maybe 20% of adults will experience depression. Most commonly, it relates to the loss of a loved one, such as a parent or sibling. Hypothyroidism is more common in adults with Down syndrome, probably affecting about half of the adults. And if hypothyroidism is not effectively treated, it can interfere with brain function and lead to memory problems. Obstructive sleep apnea is another condition more common in adults with Down syndrome, where the airway becomes blocked uh, during sleep and they have trouble breathing. And it's uh, thought that this uh, obstructed airway limits oxygen flow to the brain and it might uh, be responsible for some of the behavioral changes and the cognitive changes that you see during the day. Uh, and sensory impairments, vision impairments, and hearing or auditory impairments are much more common in adults with Down syndrome. The early onset of cataracts is common. Another condition uh, that affects the cornea called keratoconus is a bit more common in adults with Down syndrome. And hearing loss probably affects about 45% of adults with Down syn syndrome. So all of these are part of the differential. And all of these need to be excluded before you can make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And there are several more that I haven't uh, discussed here. But all may not be able to be excluded and in fact can co-occur with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And when this happens, they can further impair functioning. Effective treatment of these conditions can become even more important in that situation. Situation. We've had patients referred to us with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, but in fact, if you fit them with hearing aids because they were actually only experiencing hearing loss, uh, they miraculously recover and return to their baseline level. Uh, but that being said, you can have individuals who have Alzheimer's dementia plus a hearing loss, and uh, things can get much worse pretty rapidly for them until you recognize that hearing loss and treat it as well. So Down syndrome has long been thought of a condition uh, that uh, could be considered to have premature aging. Life expectancy for people with Down syndrome has increased dramatically in recent years. Life expectancy in about 1900 was nine years of age. 
and in the early 1980s, it had increased to the early 20s. But today, life expectancy is now 60 years of age. So that's a very dramatic increase in a short amount of time. This increase is due to several factors, including better, better medical care. Many conditions that caused early childhood deaths are now being treated. Uh, the discontinuation of the practice of institutionalization and the implementation of early childhood interventions that target development uh, have all been important in um, in allowing this uh, dramatic uh, increase in longevity. So with aging, people with Down syndrome experience physical and cognitive changes. And some of these are typical that uh, other people experience as they age. But in people with Down syndrome, they tend to experience these changes at an earlier age, say 20 years or so earlier than what you would see in the general population. And some of the organ systems in Down syndrome that might be termed to experience this premature aging include premature skin wrinkling, graying or loss of hair, osteoarthritis or arthritis in the joints, particularly affecting the limbs and the spine, and other changes in the skeletal system, hearing loss, as I mentioned, cataracts, premature tooth loss, earlier age of menopause, and as we've been discussing, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease disease. So as we've been discussing, there's a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syn syndrome. And uh, we've mentioned already that the neuropathological changes of Alzheimer's disease are present in the brain in people with Down syndrome by age 40 years of age. These comprise the amyloid plaques, uh, the tau tangles. Alzheimer's disease does not occur in 100% of individuals, though. But as in the general pop population, the incidence is age-related, and it increases with advancing age. It's thought that about 20% of individuals over age 40 with Down syndrome experience dementia, and about half of the people over age 55 and about three quarters of the people over age 60. And this is nearly six times the percentage of people in this age group who do not have Down syndrome. So six times more common at those ages of 65 uh, as compared to people from the general population. As we mentioned, it's the genetics of Down syndrome and in particular, the amyloid gene or amyloid precursor protein on chromosome 21 that's related to this pathology and this increased risk of Alzheimer's. So quite commonly, people with Down syndrome develop behavioral changes and psychological issues when they become affected with Alzheimer's disease. And there may be instances of distorted and confused thinking. We've had an individual who was repeatedly thinking their father, who had passed away several years ago, was coming to visit them that afternoon. And it was very difficult for staff to alleviate this false be 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 belief. Uh, they can show verbal and physical aggression, but most typically this occurs when they're frustrated while experiencing the loss of function, loss of functions that affect their activities, the daily living skills as they progress through the disease. They can develop suspiciousness and para paranoia, becoming overly suspicious of people and thinking they were, are, quote, out to get them. They can develop delusions or hallu hall hallucinations. Someone is stealing their things when in fact they're misplacing them, believing that the TV characters are actually living in their home. They can develop pacing behaviors or something known as sundowning, which is usually a result of agitation, it presents in the late afternoon or early evening. They develop hoarding behaviors. Some of our individuals like to gather up all the clothes from their closet, 
take them off their hangers, pile them up on their beds, and then uh, one by one neatly hang them back up in their closet before repeating this behavior again. They can develop changes in their sleep so they can stay up much later or wake up much earlier, develop excessive sleepiness during the daytime because of these nighttime sleep changes, get up in the night and wander around the house. We've probably all heard about people with Alzheimer's who have wandered away from their care setting and become lost. Uh, that is uncommon in our patients with Down syndrome. Uh, their wandering tends to be confined to the home. A few patients have been described, well, they'll open the front door and look outside in the middle of the night, uh, but uh, thank, uh, thankfully they uh, will often just close that door and go back to bed rather than wander out into the neighborhoods. They develop disinhibition. Disinhib Most commonly, the individuals will think uh, that strangers are people they know and they'll walk up to anybody they meet and give them a hug and ask them how they're doing. Alzheimer's impacts the families, of course, in very significant ways. Many adults with Down syndrome live at home with elderly parents who are facing their own age-associated health challenges. These challenges affect their ability to meet the ever-changing care needs and commonly have them to Ne neglecting their own health and well-being. It can be emotionally and physically draining to deal with the behavioral issues and new demands that the lack of mobility presents. Some of the physical challenges relate to assisting with walking, assisting with showering and bathing, assisting people getting off and on toilets and in and out of cars. Sleep deprivation is common among caregivers, and this only exacerbates some of the challenges that they're facing. We've worked with many families where the affected individual with Down syndrome is living at home with their elderly parents, and one of the parents is the main caregiver for both uh, their demented child and a demented spouse. And it's not uncommon for individual families to care for a loved one and be able to meet those care needs until some sort of crisis occurs. Uh, sometimes that crisis is an injury that occurred with the caregiver where they were trying to assist their loved one uh, with a transition, say, into bed and they injure themselves and they suddenly find themselves unable to meet those physical demands of care. And uh, that crisis then often would require uh, them considering uh, outside placement uh, for our patients with Down syndrome. Um, out of home care is often coordinated through the regional center uh, here in Orange County. It's uh, referred to as the regional center of Orange County and those services are supported through the California State Department of Developmental services. So where are individuals at these ages with Down syndrome? Most are at home with their families. Some are living on their own in the community in semi-independent uh, apartment housing uh, or even in their own homes. Uh, and uh, many others are also in a group home setting. Some of the greatest needs that these individuals have uh, is having uh, caregivers that can help them identify uh, the causes of some of the dementia related changes, uh, getting access to respite care in the home. Uh, so you can have someone come in and provide that daily care where the family members can take a break or provide them with assistive aids in the home, such as Hoyer lifts and things that can help. Um, and then also they need help planning for some of the Event, event, eventualities that occur with the con condition. Um, so some families make the decision that when it comes to the time where their loved one is going to need excessive physical supports that they may want to um, transition out into a uh, paid group home setting. 
and they can start to plan for those in advance. And then, of course, uh, as I mentioned, some of the families, of course, uh, need help uh, dealing with their own advanced aging. Um, those that are living on their own, there can be challenges identifying that Alzheimer's is present because they don't have care staff keeping a watchful eye on them. Uh, so you can have patients that are in the early stages of dementia, uh, they become forgetful, a uh, common medication they're taking might be their thyroid medication. And of course, if they're not taking their thyroid medication because Alzheimer's is causing them to forget, that only exacerbates the memory problems because now their thyroid levels are, are out of balance. Um, it can be difficult to sort out what sort of natural supports are present in the uh, independent living home environment. Most people have an ILS uh, worker or an independent living skills coach, but oftentimes that individual only greets the individual maybe once a week or so. Uh, so there can be needs to bring in some additional supports and quite often uh, there will be a need to transition for another uh, advanced uh, care setting. So some of the group home settings uh, that are available for people with developmental intellectual disabilities uh, aren't necessarily adapted for dementia related care. Uh, so there are some te te techniques that these homes can use and I'll be covering a few of those in another slide. Uh, staff education is important. And then of course, uh, following up with medical conditions as, as well. So there's an option of aging in place and that is the preferred model uh, that we uh, would uh, like to see for any of our patients who are uh, affected. So they don't have to experience a change in, in um, care staff. They don't have to experience a change in environment. We would bring supported services in to them rather than have them move into other places where uh, those more advanced care services are uh, available. Um, it's important to support the family caregivers and recognize some of the challenges this is that they're facing. Most commonly, this uh, would include the siblings and the parents. Um, and it's important to change the care uh, focus where you shift from going from making gains to that of maintaining as much function as possible. So there's going to be uh, eventual loss and decline. Um, we probably shouldn't be thinking of it as treating the condition by training people to develop new skills, but rather spending our energies on helping them maintain the skills that they have. So some of the concerns that lead to a placement outside of the home include falling, and these um, are issues that are associated with the, the lack of coordination with walking. Uh, difficulty eating is uh, common as well. People tend not to eat as much, and in the later stages of the disease, uh, they have challenges with dysphagia. And uh, one of the ways to treat that is to give them a, a thickener that uh, will allow them to uh, better able coordinate swallowing of liquids. So it's a thickener that can be added or they can switch to a, a pure a puree diet even. Um, individuals can no longer communicate in the later stages. So that's a common reason they might have to transition to another home. They can develop behavior changes, including aggression, uh, the memory loss, uh, throwing themselves on the floor. That usually relates to someone who is so agitated with trying to walk independently. They get so frightened that they just stop and sit down and refuse to ever get up. Uh, it's not a temper tantrum, but they just decide on their own. Walking is too confusing for me, so I'm sitting down. They uh, will often, or not often, I shouldn't say, but occasionally they will undress inappropriately. So they find themselves in a public restroom. And uh, since it's a restroom, uh, they're sort of maybe confused why they're there instead of 
toileting, they may just strip off all their clothes, stand there without their clothes on and wonder what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, they have difficulty getting in and out of bed, so that physical assistance uh, is re required. Uh, you can have uh, more agitation, and then you'll find them uh, not getting along as well with their housemates. Um, sometimes the medical problems of dysphagia, seizures, or the urinary incontinence would be another reason individuals might have to move out of their home. So the prevalence of Alzheimer's di disease and the impact on uh, intellectual disability services, we need to raise the index of suspicion by educating and training family members and caregivers so they can identify the individual needs of assessment and refer to appropriate providers. Designing dementia capable programs and services, these might include wellness programs that include cognitive stimulation, social interaction, exercise, or proper nutrition, transportation services, adult day services, and residential care. Support for caregivers might include education and training, counseling, care management, and respite care services. Modifications to the home envir environment could include such thing as decluttering the space, Removal of floor rugs to increase the ability to walk without having to op, uh, navigate uh, what is perceived as an ob obstacle. Uh, improved lighting, maybe the installation of grab bars in the bed in the bathrooms, rather than adapting the space for wheelchair use. Diagnostic and test technical resources should also be increased. Um, the Clinical Research Center, that, like the one I work at here at UCI, this uh, does not exist in every community. And in fact, uh, only two places west of Denver have a program like ours. Uh, and that includes uh, us here at UCI and UC San Diego. So uh, there aren't many areas where individuals with Down syndrome can go to get a comprehensive assessment. We're working on a program, though, to educate and train clinicians clinicians and research teams at all of the 32 uh, National Institutes of Health funded Alzheimer's disease research centers throughout the country uh, that will help them edu educate families. Eric, yep. Eric, I'm going to cut in just for a second and ask you to skip over the next slide. Can do that. The next slide and then go, yeah, go, go back to the next slide and go through that one and Let then we need to time, we see. need to ad we need to address our next poll question okay so, i will do that um, this is the moderator stepping in to watch our time okay thank you uh -huh. so of course family members carry the burden of watching their loved one decline they often feel helpless this decline for people with down syndrome nearly always will have them decline to such a point where they become totally dependent for all their care needs and confined to bed Families have to watch all of the hard-fought skills, such as talking, reading, and the self-care skills, as they are stripped away by this disease. Okay. It's important to recognize, though, that the decision maker for a family caregiver may often be a different person. <laughs> I'm sorry, the decision maker may be a different person from the care from the care care. Giver. Staff caregivers are much more hands on in their physical care and they have to provide assistance with ADLs such as dressing, showering, toileting, assisting with am, 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 ambulation, and weight transfers. So there's often an increased number of doctor visits that the care staffs have to adapt to, often to deal with the common comorbidities that we discussed, such as seizures pneumonias and behavior changes. So the role of the caregivers changes dramatically as the disease progresses. Uh, so the supporting of family members is important. Uh, I think you can read through some of the bullet points on these slides here, but it's important to keep them aware of what you are observing and uh, certainly encourage them to share with you what they are observing. Ask the family members about what their loved ones enjoyed in childhood, such as the type of activities that they would engage in. 
coloring books, for example, is a common one, or the music that they enjoyed in childhood, because these past memories often persist, persist rather, until late into the disease course, whereas more recently formed preferences are lost earlier in the disease process. So by getting an idea from the family members how this individual functioned, what their likes and dislikes were in the past can be a, a great help uh, to try to uh, um, manage their care in a home setting or a day program setting. Uh, of course, maintain a good relationship with the family members, be sensitive to their feelings, choose, their, choose your words carefully, using words or phrases that label, de belittle or depersonalize people can have a big ha big impact on them and their families and friends it's because it changes the way they feel about themselves. So use words and phrases that are positive. Try to empower people and treat them with dignity and respect. So the conclusions are all persons with Down syndrome develop the neuropathological hallmarks of Down syndrome by age 40. However, not all of them will develop the associated dem dem dementia. As compared to the general pop population, Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome occurs earlier in life and has a more rapid progression. Family members and paid care staff face many challenges when supporting the individuals throughout the disease proce process. And there are many supports here in Orange County to support patients and their families, caregivers. And some of those supports are mentioned on this slide. We have an Alzheimer's assessment and treatment clinic here staffed by Dr. Wu at UCI. We have an adult primary care clinic uh, staffed by Dr. Dow. We have a pediatric Down syndrome clinic at Chalk Children's Hospital staffed by Dr. Tornay and Dr. Totoyu. And then as Kim mentioned at the start of our presentation, we have a monthly psychoeducational support group. That's a collaboration between UCI, Alzheimer's Orange County, and the Regional Center of Orange County. And I want to draw your attention to our current research studies. We have two research studies that are examining Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. Both are funded by the National Institutes of Health. Both were recently uh, renewed for uh, an additional five years of funding. One study is open to adults age 40 years and older. The other study is open to individuals age 18 and older. And you have each received uh, handouts that describe these two research studies in more detail. And I would encourage you, if you'd like more information about our program here at UCI, or if you know someone that might be interested in participating in research or in need of a medical evaluation, please reach out to me at the contact information you see on the bottom of this slide. And thank you very much. Okay, well, we have run over uh, because Eric had so much interesting uh, material to share with us. So those of you who need to leave, of course, are welcome to leave and log off at this time. But we have had a number of questions. Um, we'll take a couple of them at this time, and um, the rest we'll try to answer by email. Um, Eric, let me take a look here. Um, can you advise on whether individuals with Alzheimer's are at a heightened risk for coronavirus? Uh, that's a good question. I assume they're meaning people with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. Uh, uh, well, it doesn't say that, but yeah. let's, why don't you answer it for both? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know because I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't know how well I could advise. Mm -hmm. uh, but for people with Down syndrome uh, and um, people with Alzheimer's, um, um, and that being people with Alzheimer's from the general pop, pop, pop population who are typically older, so people that tend to be 70 and 80 years of age, uh, it's my understanding uh, that this particular virus um, is affecting the elderly a bit more mm -hmm. severely than people that are younger. And people with Down syndrome tend to have uh, poor lung health. Um, Throughout adulthood, uh, in early childhood, they're at risk for increased pneumonias. 
so we don't know, but I would suspect that the same may be true for people with Down syndrome. If they were to um, contract COVID-19, that they may be at a higher risk of comp complications, in, including pneumonia. Okay. And we know this is true for, se for seasonal flu, so it makes sense that it's probably true for this virus as well. Okay, and Patricia, it's good to have you on the webinar. Good to see you here. Thank you. Um, are there equal parental inheritance, or is the disease more likely to be passed down by the mother or father? So well, I, I, I assume they're talking about Down syndrome here. I assume so as well. And those studies have not been done in people with Down syndrome. So for people with Down syndrome, the risk of early onset Alzheimer's appears to be entirely driven by the genetics of Down syndrome and the excess uh, copy of that amyloid precursor pro protein gene. It's unclear how familial genetic Factors related to Alzheimer's affect the individual with Down syndrome. Uh, but we are just starting to do those studies now, but they are challenging because uh, it's often difficult to get an accurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's in someone uh, who passed away because it often requires an autopsy. So to, to know with certainty what type of dementia the parent had can be a challenge, uh, but we, as I said, we are starting to look at that now. And some of that uh, genetic variability that they inherited from their parents may account for the variability in the age of onset of dementia in people with Down syndrome. So those people that demand in their 40s may have, in fact, inherited uh, additional risk factors from a parent in addition to having the trisomy issue. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, when a parent cares for their child with DS and Alzheimer's and the parent passes away, who takes over caring for the person with DS and Alzheimer's? I wonder because facilities are often not equipped for people with dementia and the facilities that cater to dementia seem to all be private pay. That's a good question. So people with Down syndrome are entitled to lifelong care because of their developmental disability. These cares, this care is coordinated through the regional centers, uh, but it's funded through the State Department of Developmental Services. So they have this safety net in place that's been there since birth due to their developmental disability. So if an individual should transition to dementia, there are care homes uh, through this same network that uh, will be able to provide that care through all the stages of the dis disease. Now, these licensed care homes that are available to them have varying degrees of care levels that they're able to provide. So it's not uncommon for someone with Down syndrome who was living with family members and the families pass away if they go into a, a group home setting that group home setting may be for people that have functional skills that are higher than what you would expect to someone who develops dementia. So as they lose skills, it's not uncommon for them to have to move into facilities that are licensed for a higher level of care. So they'll have more staff, say, that can assist with the, with the weight-bearing transfers and things like that. So yeah. that safety net is a big, uh, a big help for our families. Yeah. Uh, big help. Yeah, we don't have that in the dementia world, except for no. at, at the end we have Medicaid or Medicaid. Yeah. It of course eliminates so. a lot of the financial hardships that are typically seen in people affected with Alzheimer's as well. Um, okay, let's take one more question. Um, uh, with having a family, with having a member who has Alzheimer's and Down syndrome at a facility, activity-wise, are there certain restrictions or activities that are more friendly for those that you know of, or would it mostly just be case by case? 
not sure I'm understanding the question. So, I sorry. I think yeah I I think mainly we're just looking for failure free activities. Um, you know, looking back at looking, it's it's just like in the Alzheimer world. We're looking at person centered care. Yes. We're looking for things that they always enjoy doing, but then we're just going to simplify those things so that they're yeah. still able to do them and things like yeah. music or, or all, you know, things that yeah. they enjoyed. Right, Eric? Yeah, that's right. But what's most typical for people with Down syndrome who are living in a group home setting, uh, during the days they're out either at work or they're mm -hmm. in a community day program. Uh, but I think this touches on a, a issue uh, that we all should think about uh, addressing and that is uh, the day programs that they attend are specifically trained to help and assist people with developmental disabilities not dementia so right. the training of those staff is something uh, that we should really uh, strive to do a bit more of uh, it's one thing to reach out to the group homes that they're li living in but they're spending you know six seven hours a day in a day program or a workshop with staff that is probably insufficiently trained so i'm glad we're putting on pre mm -hmm. presentations like this to uh, help spread the word and uh, give resources to such groups so they yeah. can help meet those daily needs and we're actually looking at the feasibility of um do people with Down syndrome who have who now have Alzheimer's disease, is there a place for them in traditional adult day healthcare settings as well? Is that an yeah. is that an environment where they could thrive? Because we don't want them uh, once they're not appropriate for their day programs, their traditional day programs, or their traditional jobs. We don't want them sitting in a group home with a one on one aid, just you know, not. Yeah not in an environment where they we want them to be in an environment where they can thrive so that's something we're looking into as yeah. well and yeah. i think with that we need to uh go ahead and close our webinar for the day we thank you so much eric we're so grateful to you for your time and your expertise and i know for many of our attendees this is a relatively new topic and so we're really happy to be able to expose everyone to this and i know um People have learned a lot today. Again, we thank our sponsors, Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services, and Caring Companions at Home. Once again, tune in next month where we'll talk about legal and financial considerations in dementia care. Uh, as we close the program today, wait for your evaluation to appear on your screen. Be sure and fill that out, particularly if you're um, wanting to receive a CE for a, your uh, participation today. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.